Hello, I'm Leah, this is Riley, and we are virtual tasting hosts with In Good Taste. In Good Taste is a winery based in California. We focus on small format bottles so that you can taste a variety of wines and explore and expand your palate. Today, we are tasting through our signature flagship California wine mixer box. So these in particular are wines that you've probably had before. They are very common in California and some of them we have put our own twist on. So before we start tasting, we do like you to just kind of think about the five S's of tasting. What are the five S's? The five S's are sight, swirl, smell, sip, and savor. So these are things that you just wanna keep in mind as we're tasting. We'll talk about it a little more as we're getting through our wines. So let's get started. Riley, what are we starting off with today? We are starting off with an incredible Sauvignon Blanc with our California wine mixer kits that I am so excited to be sipping with you today, Leah. Um, this is 100% Sauvignon Blanc coming from San Luis Obispo County uh, and actually two different vineyards in San Luis Obispo County. It's going to be the Arroyo Grande Valley and Paso Robles. Uh, you're going to get these incredible different climates that are going to come together in stainless steel and that will create this very well-balanced, very excitable, very citrus-driven Sauvignon Blanc that I am super into. Uh, what do you think about it, Leah? Well, I love the Sauvignon Blanc. I love the way it smells. I really do pick up the flintiness and kind of smokiness in this, but also it does smell really bright and fruity. So definitely citrus, definitely grapefruit, some tangerine, um, even a little bit of green apple in there. It's really oh, nice. super fragrant. Um, a tip that I like to share when we're, when we're smelling a tip that I like to share when we're smelling is if you put your hand over the glass and then you swirl, when you lift your hand up, you get a big poof of fragrance so you don't have to dig your nose in to the glass. It's just a really great way to really smell everything that the wine has to offer. And this one is super, super fragrant. So what do you taste? How does your mouth react to this wine? Well, after using that amazing tool for success, which I'm so glad that you got to teach me that, um, after smelling it, and getting right on the palate, woo, right off the bat, I really do get lots of that apple flavor. Again, that flintiness. Um, sometimes you'll hear us call that minerality, more of that sense of like, ah, is it granite? Is it flint? Is it, you know, slate? You've got all of these incredible vocab words that you can use to describe the wine, but definitely right on the palate, fresh. It's so, so fresh. This is a beach wine to end all beach wines, right? Definitely, definitely. I call this a summer sipper. It's mm -hmm. La Pluma, which means feather. So it's supposed to be really light. This is great in warm weather. You could just toss mm -hmm. it back. It's got this really crisp, bright acidity, really beautiful, clean finish. It's just something that you can drink and drink and drink and drink. Really, really nice. So, you know, Sauvignon Blanc is one of those grapes that is grown all over. It's different when it's coming from different places. I think this is a really great example of a well-made Sauvignon Blanc that is really light and easy to enjoy. It's a perfect way to start off a tasting also because it's so light and just fresh and crisp. Agreed. Yeah. One of my it's exactly. One of my favorites and not being a huge Sauvignon Blanc fan, I was really impressed with Matt, what Matt Smith, our winemaker, came up with, with this different climate blend, right? I was expecting something so overly zealous in its, you know, excitable dryness, but there is a beautiful kind of like undertone of almost a tropical note, meatier, yeah. heavier, you know, just more weighted styles of fruit behind it. And I think that it would just go with so many different types of foods too. Um, yeah. Just lots of cheeses, right? Makes you think of cheese. I love this with cheese, but also any Agreed. light fish that's grilled. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it reminds me of summer. So light summer yeah. fare, definitely chicken or anything herby or slightly smoky would go great with this. Oh, really? anything smoky, white pepper. Yeah, what, what anything along those lines, arugula. That's exactly what I like to think, exactly. Nice. Yeah. It's such a good one to start out with. It really is a really, really good beginner wine. Amazing. Yeah. So our next wine is going to be our Chardonnay. So yeah, there we go. Beautiful, yeah. Our fortune favors Chardonnay. I love this Chardonnay because I think it's a great way for people to kind of ease into Chardonnay. There are a lot of ABC people out there. <laughs> that is, if you haven't heard of it, anything but Chardonnay. Um, a lot of people just have really this love-hate relationship. They either love it or they hate it. 
And, you know, Chardonnay is a grape. It's not a winemaking style. <laughs> so depending on how it's been made, where it's grown, you're going to have a lot of different, you're just going to have so many variety. You're going to have so many different variables when it comes to flavors with our Chardonnay. And this is from Monterey. So Monterey, cooler climate, very windy. And when you have a cooler climate, you do get more acid in your grapes. So you'll definitely notice that in this, it does have full malactic fermentation. So if you are not familiar with that terminal terminology, this is something that you'll see on the back of labels. You'll hear wine people talk about it. This is a word that you can throw into your wine vocab. So people will think that you are a pro. Malactic <laughs> fermentation is basically as the sugars are breaking down and they change, we get lactic sugars. And that creates a lot of creaminess in the wine and a lot of richness in the wine, which some people, you know, aren't really a fan of, but I love exactly. this one because it's so balanced. Exactly. Could not agree more. That's the thing. It's a very polarizing grape, uh, despite the fact that it's really the style that we end up not liking a lot of the time. And some of us really do enjoy those beautiful caramel tones behind a nice Chardonnay. And some of us do prefer something a little bit more acid driven. Uh, and I think for those of you who like a petite Chablis, a Chablis in general, um, a Tasmanian Chardonnay as well, yeah. a New Zealand Chardonnay, right? Something from one of those uh, higher uh, elevation and colder climates, you're really going to end up enjoying something with a little bit more acid behind it, like our Central Coast Chardonnay. This one just is beautiful. Are you getting those like almost brioche notes on the yeah. on the nose, no right? Super zesty. And just exactly. really, like hints of vanilla and I get lemon and lime zest on the nose of this Chardonnay. It totally. just smells so beautiful. Personally, not a huge California Chardonnay fan. I finished this entire bottle. Oh, um, that's so cool to hear. <laughs> so it's really, really delicious. And you really get these really nice subtle hints of vanilla and butterscotch on the finish of the wine. So after you taste it, you feel that it's definitely heavier than the Sauvignon Blanc. You mm -hmm. know, it's a great way to, to um, identify the weight of the wine. The Sauvignon Blanc was super light. Hence, we call it Pluma. The Chardonnay, it is a little heavier. It's a little more round. There's a touch of richness there, but really subtle. Everything is really balanced. It's like, it's kind of like a symphony. It is. It's so well-rounded. I could not say it any better. It's incredibly well-rounded. It uh, really makes up for the citrus flavors by having those more savory aspects towards the end. That's what you're looking for. Um, I think that's what we, the vocabulary words, we aren't always super capable of putting on to our wine descriptions, right? Yeah. We're, we don't always have the ways to say what we're looking for. You want something balanced. You want something well-rounded. Um, and I think with this one, I tell all of my clients that I like to hang out with, you know, I want cheese with this one too, but I don't want something creamy. I want a nice sharp cheddar. Yep. right? Because it's got all of that beautiful acidity behind it. It's got all of that structure behind it as well. Um, I think it would go super, super well with a lot of different fare, but I'm thinking like Cheez-Its, Cheetos, anything with cheddar, I could definitely uh, do a nice snack I with agree. this one. I totally agree. And I also always like to share just some classic pairings. Classic pairing with Chardonnay is like roasted chicken, herb roasted chicken, lemon herb Absolutely. roasted chicken would go delicious with this. And you have a really cool um pairing that you like to share with the chardonnay too i do i do i love me some roasted carrots but i love them when they are candied uh so i take baby carrots and i slather them in honey and moroccan chili oils things like that uh, and i let them oven roast for just long enough to get nice and tender and i think all of that spice and all of the sweet tones that come from behind the honey really lend so so well to the chardonnay because it goes through mallow and it comes from that cold climate. It's again, getting two different styles of wine blended together. Matt is just really, really doing a great job of showcasing what California is capable of. Uh, and I think that's a, a thank you. I love showing off my favorite <laughs> cooking uh, cooking technique. So thank you, Leah. <laughs> awesome. Okay, Riley. So we're moving on to our next wine. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about rosé? Oh, I'm an equal opportunity rosé drinker, my friends. For all of you at home, I'm sure you can agree that rosé is delicious, but I personally love it all year round. It could be negative 10, 110, it really doesn't matter. I will drink rosé all year round. Uh, I think, Leah, you might be a little bit more of a seasonal sipper, right? I am. I am. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to be convinced. This one has really <laughs> kind of made me think, all right, 
it's not just for summer, particularly with this particular um, rosé. This one is made to be a little, a little rounder, a little fuller. We call it a winter rosé. Oh, right. um, this is a Cab Zinfandel blend rosé. And I always, I do love, pink is one of my favorite colors and I love the color of this. It's beautiful. It's really pretty. And so if you're tasting along with us, now would be a good time to, to shout at the screen how you think we get the pretty pink color in the rosé because yeah. there are plenty of ways that we could do this. But how do we get the pink color in the rosé? Do we get the pink color? Is it a blend of white and reds? Is it only red? Uh, is it magic? I'd like to think that there's definitely magic going on in all definitely. wine production, obviously. <laughs> Love and magic is what makes the wine in your glass. Uh, but it is going to be skin contact from those red grapes. Every now and then, very, very small amounts, you will find a blend of white and red, sometimes in your champagnes, sometimes in other styles from around the world, but most of the time, your still rosés are going to be made from red grapes, getting skin contact on that clear must, the juice coming from your pressed grapes. Uh, and you can allow it for a couple hours, a couple days, sometimes a couple months, if you're really looking for a beautiful pigmentation, um, but that's going to make red wine eventually. So you wanna allow a certain amount of skin contact, right, to get that beautiful jolly rancher pink color that we've got going on in your glass uh, and I think so this one pretty. is a real yeah it's a beautiful rosé you want to look at it you want to do stuff with it yeah you know whenever I smell rosés and this one is no different it's it, it smells like summer to me it you does. know you smell this it's again really fragrant you don't really need to put your hand over the glass you can just swirl it and really take in all this the, the aromas of summer raspberries and watermelon and strawberries what i really love is the citrus notes in this it reminds me of ruby red grapefruit it yes just, it smells kind of grapefruity and you get that nice juiciness on the palate again it's a winter rosé so it is a little heavier than your typical provence rosés which tend to be exactly. very 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 light um really fruity but not sweet you know, exactly. You get the essence of the fruit, but you don't get the sugar. All of our wines are fermented 100%. There is no residual sugar in these wines. So they are fruity. You get, again, that grapefruit on the palate, but nice notes of strawberry and watermelon. It's just really juicy. And it's it just summer in a glass. Like how- it is, oh. Summer in a glass, it's winter in a glass, summer in a glass, it's heartwarming, it makes you feel good. Uh, and when you think about the grapes that are being utilized in this bottle specifically, I don't think we normally think of a cab Zinfandel, Petite Syrah blends, you know, going on in this rosé. Like, you know, you're thinking something soft like a Pinot, something soft like a Grenache. You know, these are big red wine grapes, right? And that's what's giving them one gorgeous pigmentation, but to that full flavor profile, that medium body, right? Um, and right on the nose, I do get this a lot just because I think a buttered blueberry muffin is my favorite snack, but that's what I get on the nose with this one. You get fresh berries, you get fresh fruit, and there's also, again, that like softer, almost buttered tone behind it, but in such a good way, in yeah, such a yeah. like mouth watering. Like, really balanced, and balance I think balanced. is key in winemaking and just being able to enjoy wine there is not one flavor that is overpowering another you get the sweet, beautiful fruit you get the watermelon you get the strawberry you get the the citrus nice kind of acidic finish what's not to love What's not to love? <laughs> exactly. And as a, as a rosé drinker, you know, you look in my fridge at any given time, it's going to have rosé in it. Um, I just think this one hits the nail on the head because it's been so chilly this past winter. Uh, and this is what I want. This is what I want with so many different types of things, too. I want sweet, smoky barbecue sauce, yeah. uh, uh, right? I know it sounds kind of silly. We don't always think rosé and think barbecue, but I want barbecue with this. I, I think it would stand up. Yeah, I can definitely see that. And also, you know, you sip this rosé, even if it's cold and snowy outside, you kind of feel like a little summerish. So exactly. it's lovely. <laughs> this is, yeah, and again, having it at all times of year, this is coming from Northern California. I want to walk through the beautiful vineyards of Napa. I want to hang yeah. out in Sonoma with this rosé. I want to sit and enjoy a nice afternoon hanging out in the wine, in, you know, in the winery, in the vineyards. That's what I would do with this rosé. We love pairing an experience, right? We don't yeah. always yeah. have to have food. 
<laughs> Sometimes it's just nice to think about where I want to drink this wine. Exactly. Sometimes food is overrated. Who needs it? <laughs> yeah. When the wine goes down easy, we don't always need the food. It's amazing. So I find that a lot of people prefer reds over whites. Do you find this as well? Yes. Almost across the board. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I love them all, but we're going to get into some red wines now. So let's he head over to our Pinot Noir. Yes. The so Mr. B. This is Mr. B's Pinot Noir. This is mm -hmm. a 2018 Pinot Noir. I love the label. It is the artist's dog on the label here. Really yes. cute. It's a nice thing to share with your furry friends that sometimes mm -hmm. like to join our tastings. So Pinot Noir grapes are, you know, they make some of the most expensive wines in the world. They're a finicky grape. They're hard to grow. They don't like too much sun. They don't like too much rain. They don't like too much heat. It can't be too cold. But when you get the perfect storm, Pinot Noirs are just, they're so versatile. They're really easy to drink. No tannins. The skins are very thin and have little to no tannins. And that's what makes them so, that's what makes them pretty approachable. If you know, you normally kind of shy away from red wines. It's not going to be so heavy. It's not going to really dry your mouth out. Um, but a really, really beautiful Pinot Noir, if you look at the color, you'll notice how much lighter it is than some of your other red wines. What do you smell in this glass? Oh goodness, what don't I smell in this glass? That's the cool thing about these Pinot Noirs that, that Matt is coming up with is that every new one I get even more excited about uh, just because there's so much fruit flavor behind there. But even on the nose, you notice that it's not just fruit. There is almost an earthen aspect behind it. There's uh, autumn leaves as yes. we like to, to call it. I love right? it because it does, again, we're, we're still in Monterey with this, this um, cooler central coast area. And some of your Pinot Noirs out of California smell, you get a lot of vanilla and, and cherry, but this to me smells like crushed autumn leaves, you know, in yes. the fall, dried leaves and you crush them and it kind of smells spicy and almost like tea and you get a little bit of tobacco. It's really There's nice earthiness, earthiness driving this wine. It's just, it's not what you expect. I love it. I could not agree more yet. There's, and that's the thing is I'm used to a nice young Burgundy tasting like this for those of us uh, still learning about our wine regions. Burgundy is over in France. They only make their red wines from Pinot Noir. Again, a very finicky grape. It's got hundreds of clonal variations. Uh, one of my favorites is going to be Spatzburgunde from Germany, very acid yes. forward and absolutely delicious. Uh, but you know, you've got your uh, Pacific Northwest, your PNW kind of Pinot Noirs, right? That are, as Leah was saying, more acid driven. And I think friends at home, as you are noticing and sipping along, you will see it's got so much more structure behind it. It is so beautifully elegant while still having something to say. Um, it really does not just dissipate on the palate. It lingers for a moment in such a enjoyable, like, yes, I want my mouth to taste like this. Pinot. Yeah. Um, I want spiced cherry and I want fig and I want plum and earth and, you know, autumn leaves. That's could not uh, describe it any better, Leah. That's awesome. Yeah, it is. And, and, you know, those flavors do translate on the palate and you get nice bright cherry and you get that nice spice. And it's just so easy to drink. Again, you have the fruit, you have the spice, you have some acid. Really, really beautiful. I love this with a slight chill on them. Your lighter white wines can always be served a little cooler than our heavier um your lighter red wines can always be served a little cooler than our heavier red wines. So this is a great one to have in the summer. It's just a really great year round it red really wine is. to drink. This it's is a fireside sipper for me too. I could very easily 
sip this next to a fire. Um, but yeah, having that chill on it really elevates it. Mine's got a nice chill on it right now. And I think you'll notice, again, if you've got yours, you know, right out of the fridge, it's going to warm up to the perfect temperature where your palate plays so happily with the temperature that it's at. Um, that tannin actually ends up being somewhat more obvious. Uh, I am getting that beautiful kind of mix of both oak and fruit tannin on the palate right now. And I love it. Um, it makes me want to go eat something. I really want mushroom risotto with this. Um, yeah, I want something yeah. nice and creamy and cooked and yeah, right? That's yeah, what I was that thinking with this one. <laughs> I love, love mushroom risotto. I'm getting hungry. I'm I getting know. Hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and I always do that. I can't help it. But I think, you know, having an idea of what we want to eat with this too, uh, starts to allow us to actually have the vocabulary. Um, of what we're looking for. So a lot of the time, you know, if you tell your servers, I think about my restaurants kind of background, and if you just tell me what you want to eat, I'll bring you a wine that, you know, is going to pair well with it. So when you start thinking about the, the vocabulary words you use to describe your food, you know, we can describe wine the exact same way. So. Exactly. That's a really good tip. It's a really yeah. good fun fact. I, I, I miss when we had we could go to restaurants you know nouns people places things i miss uh i miss that kind of stuff soon soon soon, soon enough exactly yeah so pinot noir really light beautiful elegant now let's get into some more powerful heavier wines our next red wine is going to be the good trouble syrah so we named this good trouble paying homage to Congressman John Lewis, who would encourage people to get into good trouble. And I think this wine can get you into good trouble, definitely. Um, our bigger red wines do tend to have higher alcohol contents and you will see that here. But you know what I love about Syrahs is the way they smell. With this one in particular, it's smoky and meaty you smell the smoke, it reminds me of barbecue. This reminds me of barbecue. You get the spice, you get black pepper, but you also get kind of some of those Christmas spices and the smokiness and just kind of the gaminess of this. It's very, very fragrant. It smells big. What do you, what do you smell in this? It smells big. That's exactly right. It smells like it's going to just like tell my mouth what's going on. Uh, it's yeah, I immediately get those fruit tones. And I think a lot of the time we think of that natural compound in Syrah, the Rotundin that smells like peppercorn, tastes like peppercorn. Um, but it's an incredibly aromatic grape. It smells so much like fruit a lot of the time. And it's plum. It's all plum on the nose, right? Lots so of much of that blackberry, blueberry, just beautiful, darkly pigmented fruits, things like that. Um, but I also, I almost get that earth flavor again too, like right oh, on the definitely. nose. It's that super animalistic animale, as they call it in uh, mm -hmm. France. It's that's super, amazing. super animalistic. Yeah, it's meaty. You were right. It's meaty. Very uh, typical meaty. of your, yeah. And that's what I love about it. And I think even this vintage too, it's even darker in pigmentation. Um, it's so, that. so purple. It's beautiful. I love that with Syrahs. They're so jammy and the color is mm -hmm. so deep, you know? Yeah. If you have Balance. glasses and you can compare the Pinot Noir to the Syrah and tip them at a 45 degree angle so you can really mm -hmm. see the color of the wine, but you'll notice just how inky this wine is. And just the way we, we could taste the weight of the wine when we went from Sauvignon Blanc to Chardonnay, you're definitely going to feel the weight of this wine on your palate. And you get those beautiful dark fruits, you get the plum, but you also get the smoke and I, and the spice. And I love Syrahs with game. Um, yeah. Lamb, lamb, a rabbit ragu, which I par apparently not everybody has had, but <laughs> you know, New York. Uh, right. Spoiled. We get spoiled in our East Coast cities yes, that yes. serve a lot of rabbit ragu. <laughs> you just want something big with this. It's exactly. really smooth, full-bodied red wine, easy to drink. The tannins are definitely there, um, much more present than with the Pinot Noir. This one, you feel it. You feel it dry your tongue out. You feel that spice on the back of the palate. It is a meat and potatoes wine. Oh, this is, couldn't, yeah. Meat and potatoes is exactly the way to put this. I want garlic mashed potatoes, uh, mm -hmm. scalloped potatoes too. I love, we love all iterations. I think as a species, we just love potatoes, but anything you can think of with them could not agree more. And I think a lot of that robustness that we're also enjoying is 
being evenly balanced with its time in oak, with its time in tank and its 22 months in oak. Uh, some of it is going to be new, but not enough to give us our very typical Napa cab style oak. This is really like, how do we express the best parts that we love about Syrah yeah. and the beauty that French oak is able to impart? Uh, and I think this one, again, it's balanced. That's the word we're always looking for is, does it have enough acidity and tannin? Is it fruit forward enough and savory? Uh, and I think this one does all of those things, but you need to eat something with it. I, definitely checks yeah. all the boxes. You definitely want food with this and something mm -hmm. big and hearty. I love just how how velvety the tannins are in yes. this. You know, so smooth. They're definitely there, but they're smooth. They're not so prickly. Mm -hmm. Just really, really full mouth feel, as we say. Yes. And if you taste this and you kind of swish it around in your mouth, you'll you'll understand the correlation be between what you're feeling and this this terminology that we use a lot in the wor wine world of the full mouth feel it it's it coats your mouth it coats your Precisely. tongue you feel those tannins on your gums and on your tongue it's really really delicious nice dry long finish really well, yes wine. Ling lingers quite well and that's the thing is you know we we do enjoy describing wine we like talking about wine that is our jobs but on top of it we are trying to actually be able to tell you what you are tasting uh it's it's for our benefit as much as as it is yours uh so when we try to describe things like a full mouthfeel we hope that we're we're hitting that for you but yeah this one is full it lingers um i think about when you take a couple breaths a minute or two after you've taken a sip of the wine are you still tasting it or do you need to take another sip? If you're still tasting it, it's got a long finish. That's kind of what yeah. we're talking about, right? That lingering sensation, it's got a long finish. Uh, I would equate it to our caps that we're used to, right? But that Sauvignon Blanc, I was ready to go back in for another sip 10 seconds later, right? Because it, it doesn't linger, it dissipates so quickly. Um, so again, some of that terminology that we like to throw around, that's what we're talking about. Uh, hopefully being able to tell you what you're tasting as much as we're tasting it, but that's the beauty and diversity in all of yes. our houses because it is uh we all taste different things that's the cool part about it sometimes i smell you know a buttered blueberry muffin but uh, we all have <laughs> we all have beautiful different and diverse palettes that's the best part exactly. about it. exactly and wine is subjective so if you're not yes. tasting or smelling what we are tasting or smelling it's not it doesn't mean it's wrong it's all subjective you may taste something completely different so feel free to experiment with pairing in your mind, what you're tasting with what is familiar to you, because a lot of tasting and smelling wine is association and what it reminds you of. And so you don't what have experience have you had? Exactly. 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 You can't describe something you've never eaten, never been to. Yeah, you're always describing previously had experiences. So you can't tell me what a kiwi tastes like if you've never had one. Wow. Uh, so, and that's that's kind of what we're trying to do. We're trying to tell you what a kiwi tastes like when you've never had one uh, and hoping that we're, you know, really getting the getting the actual flavor profiles right. But uh, yeah, whatever, whatever makes sense to you, we are here for all of your vocabulary words. Yes, absolutely. So sticking with our red wines, mm -hmm. our next red wine is going to be the Balance of Powers California Red Blend. This is definitely one of my favorites. I love all of our wines. We're very fortunate to have so many wonderful wines that we get to taste through and talk about regularly. Um, this is Zinfandel based. It is vast majority Zinfandel and Red Zins are always very powerful. This is something that California does so well. It's one of my favorite varietals um, that is popular in California. Always just really velvety, very powerful. I mean, these go into the tank. And when we say that, that means before they're crushed, like when we pick them, very, very high levels of sugar in this grape that sugar turns into alcohol. So you will have a hard time finding a Zen or a Zen based wine that is less than 14% alcohol. It really, it's, it's a boozy wine. Um, they're always very powerful. I call this a hug in a glass. This is my favorite cold weather wine. This is so smooth and velvety and it's a lot of cooked fruit. So if you think of jamminess. If you just think of jam, blackberry jam and blueberry jam, it's super jammy on the nose. A lot of Christmas spices, 
cinnamon and cloves. It, it kind of might remind you of mold wine. It definitely is one of those wines that, you know, fire pit wine, as you said. Exactly. Parent experience. Totally. What do you smell in this one? Um, I, my first thought, like I smelled blueberry, obviously, but I first thought blueberry panna cotta, uh, that cooked cream. That's like, that's what I want to eat with it. I know that it's a dessert and it's not supposed to go with a dry red wine, but that's the first thing I thought. Um, just because I love blueberry compote. I love a nice jammy cooked stewed fruit tone. And that's exactly what's going on with this wine. Um, so yeah, I get the total blueberry tones, but I can also smell a little bit of earthiness and that's going to come from its oak influence. So yeah, it sees its time in its tank, but then we throw it in some French oak and it absolutely just melds so well to the Zinfandel and that small bit of Syrah that's leaning yeah. into this as well, into that blend. Um, definitely blend. giving you a little bit of the earthiness, helping to fill it out a little more. Well, and make it well-rounded. Exactly, it is. And you know, I like that we call this a blend rather than a Zinfandel, uh, just because blends get a bad rap. And a lot of times it's easy to think, oh, it's a red blend or it's a California blend, it's throwaway wine. First of all, we don't throw away wine. That's not a thing. Second of all, some of our best wines, some of our, our most highly revered wines are blends. Blending is really a way, I think, for a winemaker to show off their skills and their talents. Because this is a way for winemakers to really showcase some of the best characteristics of grape varietals. Um, and so if you have different grape varietals and you can show off the jamminess and you can show off some pepperiness and you can show off some like tobacco notes and all of these things. And at the end of the day, you get this really beautiful blend that is, it's gonna have a nice long finish. It may be very age worthy, all of these really great things. So the next time you're in the wine store, or in the supermarket, you don't wanna look down on your blends. We want to try them. And I love this, like I said, hug in a glass. It is a hug in the glass. It really is. It feels so good right here. Uh, it's the way you want to feel when you're drinking your red wine. This is sit down with your nice home cooked meal on the couch. This is your like, it's comfort. This is exactly what I want from a red wine. Not being a big red wine drinker. I really, really like how smooth it is. I really am appreciative of that medium body without it being so overwhelming. Um, and again, like that sense of like, we get this idea of red blends, but I think that it's the best way to showcase what those grapes and what that winemaker is capable of. Um, it's a little bit more magic. It, it's a little bit more involved, right? You really have to know what your harvest and what your yield is going to taste like, and then be able to have this like forethought of what is it going to end up being like when I'm done? Uh, and it takes so much skill and it takes so much ability. And I think that, you know, Matt really did a great job. Uh, and just one thing I want to mention with these adorable bottles of wine with our balance of power is like, you know, you can do so many cool things with them. They are utilized in so many different ways. We put our amazing, delicious wine in it, but you can feel free to put whatever you'd like into these bottles. Please feel free to reduce, reuse, and recycle all of them, because uh, that's what we want you to do with them. Matt would be thrilled. We'd all be thrilled. Um, but you know, once you've gotten the chance to try these incredible wines, you know, feel free to to go back out there, showcase them. We'd love to see you showcasing them. Show you know, show them on Instagram. Um, but yeah, that's the that's the beauty of all of it. Is it starts to just you know. It, I make back into all of it and put Sorry. my salad dressings in them. They're perfect exactly. for that. And oil and vinegars, yeah. Oil and vinegar. You can use them for flowers. You can pour pre-made cocktails in them in the summertime and yes. put them in your purse. We love other alcohol in different alcohol bottles. That's exactly. like the it's just it feels right when you do it. it. It's meant to be. That's yes, exactly. This one, this one's just it is. It's a hug in a glass, Leah. I could not agree more with that. Um, and just like where it's coming from too, in that kind of warmer AVA. Mm -hmm. um, this is the Fair Play AVA. Uh, yes, coming from up in Northern California. It's hot. It's going to make more of those fruit forward high ABV alcohol by volume kinds of wines, just more robust, uh, but it's still so well balanced. It's not overwhelming. That's what I love about it. Again, balance is key. Balance. Yeah, that's why it's our balance of powers. It really is balancing these big grapes to make a really delightful, uh, easy sipping despite its body and style. 
Yeah. You know what? I like this with chocolate. And I know you Ooh. mentioned like you shouldn't have, this is a savory wine. It's a, you can, you can have sweet, sweets with your dry wines. There are no rules in wine. Mm -hmm. The only rule is to drink what you like. So definitely try this with chocolate. A dark chocolate is amazing. Yeah. It is like heavenly. So what's next? Where are we oh, going okay. next? We're going to try our next two side by side. Excellent. We're so inclined. Uh, friends at home, if you've got two glasses in front of you, incredible. We are going to try our last two wines in the kit side by side. Yep, Leah's got both of them in her hands. Uh, and that is going to be both the blue label and the green label. Label. Cabernet, you've got your Paso and your Alexander Valley. I would suggest putting the Alexander Valley in the glass you've been sipping out of your first class. That's going to be the green label. Mm -hmm. That's my suggestion, just because, you know, we've been sipping out of that one. Uh, and giving that Paso its own glass. I think it, uh, I think the Paso one deserves it, right, Leah? It's a little bit of a different iteration of cab than we're used to. Uh, so I think being able to pair them side by side and see that physical, it tastes that physical difference, really the flavor profiles and how they feel in the palate. Uh, so I would suggest doing the blue label Paso in its own fresh, clean glass. I agree. I think it's a great idea. And you mentioned that the Paso Robles is, it's a little different than what you normally expect if you typically drink a lot of California cabs. And First of all, one of the main reasons is it's aged on steel. Now, 100% of this is coming from Paso Robles. Paso Robles is in the San Luis Obispo County. So again, central coast of California. It's a little slightly inward. It's very, very warm there. And um, all of the grapes are coming from Paso and we don't throw them in oak. A lot of times you think of California cabs, you think of big, oaky, spicy, rich, powerful wines. This is still pretty powerful. It's not, it's not low on the ABV, um, but you're not getting all of the things that come with oak. A lot of times as winemakers, winemakers say that um, using oak is kind of like giving, showing the purest expression of the fruit because the steel does not impart any flavor. It doesn't impart anything. So you're just seeing great fruit shine through. And you notice that on the nose of this wine, it's grapey, it's fruity. You don't yep. smell vanilla, you don't smell the spice, you don't smell wood. You smell all of these really beautiful fruity characteristics. It's not yep. intimidating. Cabs can sometimes be a little bit intimidating and this isn't. What do you smell? Oh, I mean, they are intimidating to me every single time. And, you know, we do this for a living. Uh, I do get a little nervous every time I open a cab because I'm like, I hope I like this. Uh, but <laughs> when I opened these ones and, you know, it's not just because we work for In Good Taste. I opened these cabs and I was so excited, especially this Paso one, um, because yes, it is so fruit forward. But immediately I noticed that there was an herbaceousness behind it as well, mm -hmm. um, which you don't always pick up because our cabs usually have oak influence behind them, which hides that very intrinsic herbaceousness. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is the child of Sauvignon Blanc. And Sauvignon Blanc, as we tried first, you notice tends to taste a little bit more, you know, herbaceous, green, if you will. Uh, so having that be the parent grape, it is going to taste somewhat similar. Uh, so I get lots of bright raspberry, but it's like raspberry pop rocks almost, right? Oh, I love uh, that. Yeah, it's raspberry pop rocks and it's, you know, green bell pepper and jalapeno and it's Welch's, you know, grape juice. Sometimes your, your wine truly does taste like grape juice and it's totally okay to say. Totally right? fine. I love that. And we, and it's something that we say, it's like, it's yep. grapey. It's Smells grapey. Grape, tastes grapey. And I like the feel of this wine mm -hmm. because it's still very full bodied. It's still, you still feel those tannins. It's still definitely a cab. I yes. love um, um, the kind of minty eucalyptus yes. notes that I get out of Fresh, cab. so, so fresh. It's exactly. very, very fresh and so easy to drink. I love this with pizza. Um, oh. It's just a pizza with a lot of toppings. I, it's an easy drinking cab, but it still gives you all of those great full body characteristics. It's smooth. It's big. It nice full mouth feel, mm -hmm. nice tannic structure, nice long finish, but you just start, you're not getting all the oak. And I think this is really great because a Cabernet 
it's a grape. It's not a wine making style. So it is going to be different depending on where it's from and how it's made. And we can use a lot of different techniques in winemaking to kind of manipulate what nature has already done. And again, another shout out to our winemaker who again has done a really great job. Um, and pairing these two side by side is also a really nice way to kind of figure out your own palate and see exactly. what you like and what you don't like, especially if you're someone who has tended to shy away from the heavier reds or cabs in particular you're tasting. And the point of tasting is to see if you like something or if you don't like it. If you don't like it, great. Now you know that you can go to the store and say, huh, I don't like wines that are really, I don't like my reds to have a lot of herbaceousness to them, mm -hmm. or I prefer a lot more tannic structure. Once you have those words, you're going to be able to pick out bottles that you're going to enjoy more. And and when you're in a restaurant or you're asking for suggestions, you have the vocabulary to yeah. say what you like. The tools for success. Exactly. That's, that's, you can't be, you know, you can't be actually using them if you're not given them in the first place. So you have to be given the actual things that you're looking to say. Um, I always notice it's quite daunting to foray into how you talk about wine, how we describe wine. Uh, so I encourage you at home to talk about it however you feel like. Um, if you smell something that doesn't sound right to you, just say it out loud. No one's going to judge you. No one's going to make you feel bad about it because we all taste things differently. Just like every cab tastes different in every style and where it comes from. Again, that's the same thing with our palates. Um, but I think this one from Paso is also such a typical thing from Paso, right? They are so wild, wild west. They're so pioneer. Um, they're like, how can we do things as differently as possible? Different as uh, yeah, while we're still retaining a sense of like old world style, they really bring together both old world beauty and new age innovation. And I think that Paso is just like, this is so typical Paso. Uh, and if you're cool with this style, I think you should go hang out in Paso, try out their wines, right? Definitely. Stainless steel, clay amphora, you know, cement, whatever they can get their hands on. Uh, that's the cool thing about it exactly yeah and then we've got elegance coming from our other cab right yes. like that is true elegance coming from the the game theory from alexander valley so, so our alexander valley game theory this it, elegance is a good word for this this one is going to be a little bit more along the lines of what you may expect but not really because this is also a little more old world style so mm -hmm. it's kind of a bordeaux ish style red wine, uh, Bordeaux-ish style Cabernet. Um, this is aged on oak. So you're definitely gonna pick up the oak, but I love this. This one does give me the barnyardiness mm -hmm. that I love. Personally, yep. I like funky red wines. I like my wines to be as funky as possible. And this has a, yep. just a little bit of, you know, it smells like a barn. You yeah, that get, animalistic, that animale. Yeah wet hay mm -hmm. kind of outdoorsy smell in a very totally. very good way i love in the best way in the best way i love the way this mm -hmm. wine smells interesting mm -hmm. this is one of our lowest alcohol by volume wines um nice fruitiness in this but it's really driven by the earthy characteristics the the savoriness the herbaceousness comes through you get the oak on this as well. You get the spice. It is just, yes. Yes, it's elegant. Yes, <laughs> you could have this with a steak. Yes, you could have this with chocolate cake as well. <laughs> Definitely those tannins are a bit more aggressive than um, the rest of our wines. And Agreed. if that's something that you like, you're really going to enjoy this. What do you smell? Do you smell like the herbiness, but like in a different way? Yes. I get more thyme and rosemary, you know, not quite as that like green pepper skin and jalapeno skin. It is way more, again, it's just elegant. It makes me think of actual herbs, not, you know, fresh green, fresh cut grass. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely more into the thyme and cardamoms. And it's going to be from that oak influence, not fully taking over the intrinsic aromas behind the grape itself. Um, but yeah, picking at a lower bricks, like you were mentioning, just allows it to not have to sacrifice a 15% wine, you know, hiding behind that alcohol 
alcohol percentage, which to us on our palates tastes hot, tastes like heat, tastes like sometimes like a shot of vodka, you know, if they're a little too high ABV. Uh, So you don't have to sacrifice. You're getting all of the aromas that we love with a wine that's actually sippable. That's always what I'm looking for. I think that's what scares me about cabs a lot of the time is I can only have a glass. They're 15% and I have quarantine tolerance these days. Uh, So I, you know, this one. Quarantine tolerance means you can drink a lot. Not anymore. Mine went the opposite direction. I uh, I can have a glass of wine and I'm ready for bed at eight o'clock. That's so this eight. is, <laughs> I'm a cheap date now, you know, but that's the, that's the cool part about it is that I don't have to sacrifice the fact that I only get one glass of wine because uh, I can truly enjoy this one and even go back for a second one because uh, yeah, it's not and sitting so high. It's like a wine that you want to enjoy. You want to yes. savor it. Like this you is do. a wine that you enjoy just you know, each sip that you take, you're like, mm, it's so good. Yes. And there's a new flavor. There's a new aroma. There's a new scent every single time. Uh, that's why you'll see us when we are moving through and talking about our five S's, uh, you'll see me swirling. You'll see me sniffing. Uh, you're utilizing those tools for success, again, as a way to learn more about the wine. Uh, as you're swirling it too, you're air reading it. You're oxidating it. You will learn more about the wine every second. Uh, I'm sure, Leah, you know this as well, but we always tend to like the second glass in a bottle. Yeah. right more than we liked the first one and that's because it's had more time to aerate and oxidate uh so give it a swirl you don't have to swirl it just one time i promise it'll come on become unconscious uh you'll start (laughs) swirling your soda water and swirling your coffee all the time don't swirl hot coffee um but please you know take the chance to actually aerate your wine to let it express itself. It's a living, breathing organism. It will change and, you know, aerate and just get so much better as you allow it to expose itself. This is a wine that you want to savor, you know, like Mm -hmm. let your, drink the wine, swallow the wine and give yourself five, 10, 15, 30 seconds to see how the wine is changing in your mouth, what you're tasting. Are you Mm -hmm. still tasting it? Did you like the way it tasted in the beginning versus the way it tastes in the end? That is the savoring part. And that is also very, very important because that's when you, again, find out, oh, I do like this. I do like that funky finish. I do taste that kind of earthy barnyardiness on the back of my palate or in the middle of my tongue. Or I do make my mouth happy. On the sides, all of those things. It's a really important part of enjoying wine. Sometimes we all have days where you just want to gulp. Yeah. But... You know, wine is meant to be enjoyed and you want to really savor that at least the first couple of sips. Yes. Just the first couple. That's all we really ask of you is the first couple. Think about whether you do really like that wine or not. Uh, It's something I remind people too, you know, when you're getting served and being given that opportunity to try a wine before they pour it for you, use that as your first time actually sipping, savoring, and thinking about what you like about it. Uh, You know, we don't come over uh, just to hear ourselves talk most of the time. We do want to offer you, you know, a second to say, hey, do I want to drink this white wine with my fish? Do I want to drink this cab, you know, with my roasted asparagus and my steak? Uh, we're giving you the opportunity. And I think that now that we have these, these words and this vocabulary and our, our thought process, you can really actually tell that server, you know what? I don't like this wine. Or you know what? I do like this wine. It does yeah. make me happy. I do want to drink it. And that's always, uh, that's what we're looking for. It doesn't make your mouth happy. That's what we care about the most. What is your favorite? Oh, that's so hard, Leah. Um, I think my favorite has to either be the Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir, objectively, and Rosé, subjectively. What about you? Uh, So I think that my favorite is the Chardonnay, but it changes. But right now, it's it's the Chardonnay. And the Pinot Noir is a close second. But I I really love our Chard, and I'm not a big California Chardonnay enjoyer. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I really do enjoy this wine and, and so I am always recommending it to all of my tasters and, Mm -hmm. and people tasting different boxes, by the way, we do have three different boxes. Yes. So definitely feel free to, um, try them all, but I, I always go back to lately. I've been going back to that Chardonnay. It's definitely my favorite. And then a close, very, very close second 
would be the Pinot Noir. So I guess uh, I like wines from Monterey, I guess. Yeah, I, like I guess, I mean, as per usual, you and I are on the same wavelength. We pretty much tend to like the same stuff, which I adore. Um, but yeah, there's it's something about seeing what California is capable of outside of just the typical stuff that we are used to yeah. seeing on grocery store shelves. Uh, I think we get excited as, as wine geeks that we're like, ah, we know that you're capable of doing those things. And it's so, so cool to see that there are people out there uh, really showcasing what those different regions and what that terroir is capable of. Um, but yeah, that's the, and as Leah mentioned, we have other kits. So you are all more than welcome to ask for us, for Leah, for Riley, uh, if you wanna do some cool tasting stuff with us. This is our uh, flagship kit. California Wine Mixer was the one we went DTC, direct to consumer for you, uh, in an attempt to showcase what we're capable of and what you know in good taste in the wines that we uh, get and resource are capable of as well um so yeah that's been thank you so much for hanging out with me leah yeah. um again my name is leah this is riley thank you so much for tasting with us we hope that you had a great time we hope that you learned some things and we hope that you will also come back and try our other kits we love tasting with you um enjoy your wine cheers riley cheers leah thank you